On a typical Sunday, I will select a, a passage of scripture and unpack it in an attempt to make its meaning clear so we can all apply its teachings to our lives. But some passages really require a different approach. Today, I would like to look at Luke chapter 18, which addresses the practice of prayer and does so with the help of six different stories or parables about prayer. Now, these stories are all familiar to you. I've, I've preached on them all from, from time to time. But rather than looking at each of them individually, the challenge today will be to see how all of these pieces fit together to form a bigger picture on the subject of prayer. Um, a few weeks ago, I unpacked the first of these stories where an unjust judge who really didn't care about people found himself feeling harassed and annoyed and hounded by a persistent widow. Finally, the judge decided he would take care of her case just to get her off his back. He was tired of her nagging. He was tired of being pestered. And Jesus highlights the lesson that if even this uncaring, unjust judge could be moved to act by this woman's persistence, how much more quickly will our Father in heaven, who really does love us and care for us, act on, on our behalf? Jesus said, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Persistence is an important lesson in prayer. Oh, we may not get what we think we want, but prayer can change us to face the circumstances. Sometimes, sometimes we think that our little everyday problems are really, really not important enough to bother God about. I mean, the world is full of very serious problems. There's the war in the Ukraine, you've got North Korea firing missiles, you've got climate change, you've got immigrants drowning trying to reach the United States. I mean, even the very worst of my problems just seems trivial in comparison. I get upset when I put a folder down and I don't know what I did with it. I, suddenly I can't find it and I waste a full half hour looking for it. If I had just paid more attention with it, I wouldn't be in this mess. I mean, it's my fault. I'm not going to bother God about this. Except, you know, we, we, we learn from this, this passage that God wants to be bothered. God wants to hear from us. God wants to hear about our stupid little anxieties. So eventually, in desperation, I calm down. I pray. And you know, for me, sometimes it's, it's as if the fog lifts. The, the anxieties quiet themselves. The, the storm is calmed. The mist clears from my eyes, and I say, oh, look at that. It's right here on my desk. Never mind, God, I found it. I did it. I took care of it. You know, ah. the first lesson is don't, don't be prejudging how stupid your prayers are. Don't prejudge that. Don't prejudge if this prayer is really worthy or, or not. Just, just pray. 
As I said, prayers may not bring you the the answer you're looking for, but sometimes our prayers change us to face the situation. Well, lesson number two on the subject of prayer is, is found in the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. You'll remember this verse. The tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. He beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you that this man, rather than the the Pharisee, the the self-righteous Pharisee, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Two characters, a Pharisee and a tax collector, both went up to the temple to pray. The Pharisee stood looking up into heaven, arms outstretched, wrapped in his own self-righteousness, his own pride. He had selected three areas that he wanted to be graded on or, or judged on. In those three areas, he really excelled. He follows the commandments scrupulously. He gives to the financial support of the temple. He fasts twice a week, not just once, twice. In these self-selected areas, he really shines. You ever do that? You look at the places where you're pretty good and say, well, look, look over here. These, this is what I want to be graded on rather than the big picture. A godly life is more than those three things that the Pharisee was crowing about. It includes a surrender to God's will. It includes concern for others. Pharisee probably lived in a gated community where he could be uh, uh, well away from anyone that had troubles or anyone who needed mercy or, or, or compassion. But the Pharisee needed to grow beyond the walls of his own pride, his own comfort, in order to really see other people that God cared about even though he might despise them for their lack of discipline, that was probably the area God wanted him to grow in. And then we have this poor tax collector, uh, traitorously raising money for the Roman government. And this tax collector knew he was a sinner. He would not even raise his eyes to, to heaven, but stood striking his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm a mess, and I know it, and you know it, and Jesus tells us that the tax collector's simple, honest prayer of helpless disclosure is the one that moved God. Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified. We read in Psalm 51, the sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. God will not despise a broken and a humbled heart. Well, the the next story begins here in uh, verse 15. And we read, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Three characters have come before, three will follow. In this case, no names are given. We read simply of infants and children who had come to see Jesus and the disciples were not about to to let that happen. Jesus is probably thinking up a fresh parable, and you get these kids rattling around, he's going to forget it. It's going to slip his mind. Let these noisy little, little children keep their distance. Jesus was too busy. He had serious things to, 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 to be about. But Jesus called out, saying, let the little children come to me. 
for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Well, the children, toddlers, little ones, they, they were not coming with their own resume of righteousness, giving them a distorted sense of having earned the right to come. Rather, they came with nothing except a sense of trust and the expectation that they were valued, they would be welcomed, and so they were. And perhaps this is one of the central messages of the chapter. Jesus invites all of us to come with empty hands, with no claim to our own righteousness, but simply with trust in God and the expectation that God loves us. Well, next, we have the rich young ruler. Jesus said to him, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. He was apparently a righteous person who followed the commandments, probably a very nice guy. Many things about his life were, were excellent, but unlike the Pharisee of the, of the second story, he knows there is still miles to go before he, before he sleeps. He is successful, but he's not satisfied with his life, and he asks Jesus, how can I have eternal life? How can I have the life that God wants me to have in all of its fullness and completeness? He wants a life that's fulfilling and, and satisfying. In John's Gospel, Jesus promoted this expectation, saying, I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. So, so what must I do to have the fulfilling life that God wants me to have? And Jesus looked at this rich young ruler who seemed to have everything that life could offer. He had wealth. He was still young and full of energy and health. He was a ruler which suggested he had status and prestige within the community. Already he was a person of influence. But Jesus looked at these things which looked so good from a worldly point of view and saw that they were really just golden handcuffs. The young man had gotten trapped into a, a definition of success that really wasn't very satisfying. Perhaps it was his parents who pushed him down that path. Perhaps his spouse enjoyed the status and expected the perks that his position brought. Perhaps the eventual success of his children demanded that he keep his nose to the grindstone year after year, even after it seemed hollow and held no pleasure for him. Jesus challenged him to leave his old life behind and come and follow him. Perhaps there was a time in your life when you asked that same question, saying, I don't want to merely survive. I want to have a full, significant, satisfying life that God wants me to have. Jesus encouraged him to break free, but he just couldn't do it. And he left sad and feeling dejected. You see, he wanted to serve two masters. He still wanted to keep the wealth and the power and the prestige and the respect that his position brought, and he just couldn't leave it, and he left sadly. Hmm. In the next section, we come to the 12 disciples who heard all of this, and were stunned and were perhaps bewildered by it. They, they asked Jesus, man, if, if surrendering 
wealth and status and everything we've worked our whole lives to obtain is a requirement for entering the kingdom of, of, of God, who could ever, who could ever be, be saved? Well, back at the beginning of the chapter, we learned that God can be moved. The next question is, can we be moved? And this exchange makes it appear as though the answer is, is no. We cannot be moved. Each one of us is sometimes like that rich young ruler who is unwilling to sacrifice what seems to be most important in their lives. Fortunately, Jesus said, what is impossible for humanity is possible for God. Then Jesus took the disciples aside and began to explain how God makes the impossible possible by telling them, his closest friends, what was about to happen. We are going to Jerusalem, and very soon, everything that was written by the prophets about the Son of God will be accomplished. He will be arrested. He will be mocked and insulted and spit upon and flogged and killed, but will rise again on the third day. The disciples didn't understand a bit of it. It was as if they were blind. Now, the chapter ends with the final story, the story of the blind beggar. This one story recaps all of the lessons contained within this chapter. The blind beggar was shouting out to Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And people in the crowd around him told him to be quiet, told him uh, not to make a nuisance of himself, but he kept on shouting. You see, like, like the widow in the first parable, he was persistent. He asks for mercy because there was nothing that he could do in return. There was nothing he had that, that he could give. All he could do was beg for mercy. And this, you remember, was the appeal of the tax collector, not the Pharisee. And Jesus stopped hearing this man, hearing him call out to him. And with the same words that he had given to the children, he says, let him come. Let him come. Jesus, God incarnate, who embodied the will and the desires of the creator toward the creation, asked the blind man, what do you want from me? What do you want me to do for you? What is it you're searching for? Like the, the rich young ruler, perhaps we are sometimes trapped in our own pride, our own determination to fix things ourselves, uh, our, our embarrassment about stupid prayers or mistakes that, that, that we have made, or our fear that God is tired of hearing from us while we continue to stumble and live imperfect lives, or in this world of mathematic certainty, we may have questions about our unscientific faith. Jesus asked the blind man, what do you want from me? The disciples were blind, but they didn't know it. This man knew he was blind and knew he wanted to be able to see. And Jesus said, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. And immediately he received his sight and he began to follow Jesus. Jesus 
had asked the rich young ruler to follow him, but, but he couldn't. But once this blind man could see clearly, he could follow, and he did. So this, this chapter provides many lessons. We see the persistence of the widow. We see the humility of the tax collector. We see the trusting children being called to Jesus. We see the rich, young ruler unable to serve two masters. We, de- we, we see the disciples blind and without understanding. And finally, we see the blind man, persistent, crying out for mercy, coming when invited, wanting a cure for his blindness, and then being willing to follow Jesus. Do you see yourself in this chapter? Does God see you in this chapter? Please consider these lessons as you engage in prayer and bring before the Almighty the deepest needs of your life. Amen.